But look at verse number 1. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Actually, verse 2. It says there, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? The title of the sermon tonight is King of the Jews. King of the Jews. You know, Jesus Christ truly is the King of Kings. He truly is the Lord of Lords. And here immediately, as soon as we hear about this babe being born, the Bible calls him the King of the Jews. Okay? So it's an amazing thing that this is straight away, as soon as he's born, this is how he's identified. Look at verse number 1, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. All right? So you guys are pretty familiar with the story of Christmas. All right? A lot of children grew up knowing the story of Christmas. You know, as long as they've not been taught about Santa Claus and all that nonsense, if they've been taught a little bit about the birth of Christ, they're probably familiar with a lot of this. Now, a lot of uh, Christmas models, you know, and they have the babe in the manger and Mary and the shepherds and the sheep and all those kind of things, many times they include the wise men, okay? And usually three wise men or three kings they include in that story. But what we'll see here developing, if you remember chapter 1, that, that covered the birth of Christ. But here in chapter 2, it's actually a couple of years or at least a few months after the birth of Christ, Okay. And we'll pick this up soon. Look at, look at this. Actually, before we turn away, can you please turn to the book of Isaiah? Turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 60. I want to show you something. The book of Isaiah chapter 60. Because the Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men came uh, to Jerusalem. All it tells us is they came from the east. These wise men were not Jews. Okay, They were coming from other parts of the world, from east. Of, um, I'll, I'll look at this soon. Where, where are they coming from? Turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. All right. Now, are you guys familiar with that song, We Free Kings? We Free Kings from Orient. All right. Now, the Bible never really calls these people kings, it does call them wise men. Okay. And it is wise to come and search for the king of the Jews, it is wise to come to worship him. All right. But I just want to show you in Isaiah 60. Where the idea of them being kings comes from, okay? Where does it come from? Look at Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So here we have in verse uh, 3 that the Gentiles will come and kings will come to the brightness of his rising. And many people associate this with this portion of, of Scripture where the wise men that are Gentiles are traveling to see this newborn uh, Christ. Okay. Now I'm not completely sold. I'm not completely dogmatic that this is about the wise men. But there's a lot of interesting things here. Look at verse number 4. Lift up thine eyes round about and see... All they gather themselves together, they come to see, thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Now look at this in verse 6. This is why you get the pictures of these kings or these wise men coming in camels, coming right on camels, if you guys... I familiar with that? It says here in verse number 6, The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ipa, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. Now, what were the gifts that the wise men gave Jesus? We're going to see this later on in this chapter. But it was definitely incense and gold. Okay, we see that parallel then in verse number 6. And they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. So notice in verse number 6, it tells us where these Gentiles are coming from. It says, of Midian. Okay? Now, Midian today is what we would call Saudi Arabia. Okay? People come from Saudi Arabia, and that is east of Israel. That is east of of Jerusalem. That would make sense because these wise men are coming from the east. But notice it also said Midian in verse 6, Midian and um, 
Ipah. Okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Ipah. But I looked that up, and that's modern day Iran. That's modern day Iran, again, east of Jerusalem. And then in verse number seven, it says, All the flocks of Kira, and that's modern day Iraq, that's modern day Iraq, shall be gathered together unto thee. So if this is a parallel passage of the wise men, then you can see why people think of them as kings coming from the east, they're coming from Gentile nations, and they're coming to see the king of the Jews. All right? Now, often, you know, today we don't think about Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq, thinking about Jesus Christ coming to serve the Lord of the Bible, right? But we see in the time of Christ that people were coming from these areas to worship Him. The only one that's left field out of that portion there is uh, verse number 6. It says, All they from Sheba shall come. So Sheba is known pro as, as probably Ethiopia. So that would be west, west of Jerusalem. That's the only difference there. But of course, that is also includes other Gentiles coming to see uh, Christ. So a lot of people do associate Isaiah chapter 60 with the wise men. Okay, and I think you can see some parallels there. Coming from the east, Gentiles bringing the gold and incense. And I think there's a probably a good case that it definitely is about the wise men. But I'm, I wouldn't be totally dogmatic on that, okay? Anyway, turn to back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. It says, saying, what are these wise men saying? Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Right? They've come to worship the king of the Jews. Now, you guys were in Isaiah. I should have told you to stay in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9, okay? Now, while you're turning to Isaiah chapter 9, I'm going to read to you from 2 Samuel, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's where I'm going to be reading you to, from. But you guys turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, this is something that God told King David, all right? What did he tell King David? It says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, or when you pass away, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom Forever. So we know this is talking pri primarily or, uh, you know, about Solomon. That King Solomon would come from the bowels of, of David, right? Of David, and that he would build a house for the Lord, that he would build a temple in Jerusalem. But notice that it said that, uh, what I read, it said that the throne of his kingdom forever. This kingdom is forever. This kingdom is eternal. But look at verse 14. Uh, I keep reading verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Okay, And as I start reading this, you're going to notice that this is more than just Solomon. This has also a double portion of prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Okay, uh, But it says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. And that could be a picture of Christ as well, being crucified, taken on, you know, not his own sin, but taken on our sin and being chastised by God, by being smitten, being whipped and nailed on the cross. We could apply that as well. But then verse 16 says this, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. All right? Now, again, I, I asked this question last week. Does Israel, earthly Israel right now, does earthly Israel have a kingdom? Does it have a king? No. All right? And it's only been recent years that Israel even exists as a nation. Okay? Uh, for 2,000 years, you know, it's, it, it's been without the nation of Israel. You know, the, 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 the Jews have been scattered from all areas of the world. Okay? And so, was, was God lying when he said this kingdom will be established forever? Of course not. Okay? Because we know from the previous chapter that Jesus would also be a descendant of King David. And we know that Jesus is the seed of King David, the seed of Abraham, right? And when God spoke about his kingdom and being established forever, we're talking about the eternal kingdom of God, all right? The kingdom of God, which has come when Jesus Christ came, he came as the king, right? And we know that spiritually speaking, when people get saved, they enter into the kingdom of God, but we also have the millennium to come. We have the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus Christ hands that kingdom to the Father, and that kingdom will be established forever. 
okay, forever. If you've been saved, then you are a member of that kingdom of God. You have entered in to that kingdom of God already, spiritually speaking. It's been established as far as God is concerned. Okay, so we see the importance of Jesus being the king of the Jews. That he would be a descendant of David. And we saw that proof in the genealogy last week in, the chapter, in chapter 1. All right. But you guys are in Isaiah 9. Look at Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. This is a great uh, prophecy from the, from the prophet Isaiah. And he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Hey, Christ came with a kingdom. He's got his government upon him. And it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There's no end to his government. There's no end to his kingdom. It says, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we see, yeah, the great prophecy of Christ here, being born into the world, His Son will be given to us, right? But we also know that He's got His kingdom, okay? And that He's going to rule, and He definitely is the King. This is why the Bible calls Him the King of Kings. You know, He came from the lineage of kings. He was the King of King David. He was the King of King Solomon, okay? And if we tie in Isaiah 60 with the wise men, then they were kings as well. It's not just the king of the Jews, but the king of the Gentiles. Even the Gentile wise men, or at least the kings, came to seek him and to worship him. Okay? We truly have the king of kings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Verse number 3. Now, <clears throat> I'll just read it. When, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Now, this verse is pretty much the reason why a lot of people don't think it was three. You know, the three wise men, the three kings. Um, a lot of people think it was much more than three. They think it might have been a caravan of maybe even hundreds of people coming to see Christ. Okay, not just these wise men, but all their all their servants and all their workers, all that as well, um, come in. The reason being that is, if it was just three people walking into Jerusalem, I don't think King Herod would have really cared. All right. But the, if there was a great amount of people traveling from the east and, and they're talking, hey, where's the king of the Jews? Then you can understand why that would trouble Herod and it would trouble all Jerusalem. Okay, Because this was, would be a significant uh, event of people coming into Jerusalem. Look at verse number four. And when they had gathered all the... Sorry, before I read that, I was just thinking about um, you know, the United States. You've got this caravan of uh, Latinos trying to get into to, to America. Have you guys been hearing about that in the news? I, mean, I don't know how many thousands... I guess it's kind of like that. Maybe there was like literally like just this huge caravan of people coming to Jerusalem. Where's, where's Jesus Christ? Where is he? Where's this king of the Jews? So we can come and worship him. All right. But anyway, verse number four. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. All right. It's, it's amazing that the Jews themselves hadn't worked this out, but the Gentiles had worked out, hey, this is about the time that he should be born, right? And we know that the, the, the wise men were following our star from the east, the light from the east. And uh, verse number five, and they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least, sorry, art, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Okay, so once he gathered the chief priests and the scribes and they studied out, they worked out, oh yeah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay? Now, the book of Matthew uh, is a very interesting gospel, okay? It, it is, it is uh, the gospel which turns to the Old Testament more than any, any of the others, okay? Quite often you'll see, as the prophets had spoken or as the prophets had written, um, and I think when you're studying the Bible, even when you're just reading the Bible, I strongly recommend when you see passages like this, you know, it says, um, you know, so where was it? It says uh, in verse number uh, 5, For thus it was written by the prophet, I really encourage you to go back to the Old Testament and see where that was written. Because quite often, the Old Testament will give us a lot more information, a lot more detail than just that one little passage that was written. So I'll just give you a quick example of this. That uh, writing was found in the book of Micah. You don't need to turn there. You can turn there if you're fast enough. But Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. I'll just read it to you. 
Micah chapter 5 verse 2, because there was a little part that was missing in what was written there in the New Testament. I'll just read it to you, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. <clears throat> it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though there be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in, uh, in Israel. But this is the part that's missing. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Hey, this one that would come from Judah, and if you remember, that he, had, he was also prophesied that Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah, right? But it also said that he's from old, he's from everlasting. Even though he was born in Bethlehem, hey, that was not the beginning of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is the Word of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. And that was not his beginning. Bethlehem's manger was not his beginning, all right? The Bible says here in Micah that he was of old from everlasting. Okay? He is God. He is the creator of all things. So it's not just an earthly king, but it's God manifest in the flesh. And he's from eternal, and we know that his kingdom is forever. His kingdom is eternal. Okay? And then uh, go back to, back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. So I just wanted to show you, it's really cool to go back to the Old Testament, because you can pick up a lot of other information there. But uh, number 10, verse number 10. Sorry, not, not number 10, verse number 7. And Herod, when he called privily, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You think Herod the king wanted to worship Jesus? We'll see in this chapter that that wasn't his plan. All right? He had nefarious plans. He wanted to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that's why it troubled him. You know, in verse number three, it troubled him to hear that the king of the Jews was born. Um, uh, but uh, verse number... What am I up to, guys? I think I need glasses now. Verse number nine? Verse number nine? Yeah, verse number nine. Uh, when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, a lot of people have done research. If you type in this star of Bethlehem or, you know, the, 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 the Christmas star, a lot of people have done a lot of research to try to work out what this star is, you know. And they'll look at the night sky and they'll try to work out, you know, you know back in whatever date that might have been, um, you know, which stars was the one that was kind of over Bethlehem. And, you know, people think it might have been, you know, the planet Jupiter or whatever. I don't think that's really a worthwhile study, you know. I think... This star is a supernatural star. I think it's a miracle. You know, the fact that, it, it, you know, they just found the star again, you know, it, it led them all the way to Jerusalem to begin with, and now it's going to lead them to Bethlehem. And as we'll soon see, this light of the star literally stops above the house where Jesus was. All right, so this doesn't sound like your average star. This, this might very well be, you know, a miracle of God, maybe even an angel, but that's, that's my belief. If you guys are wondering, I think it's just a supernatural uh, uh, occurrence that took place here. But verse number 10, verse number 10. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding, they, sorry, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Okay, so frankincense, you can see in the writing there, it's, it's incense. And so is myrrh, okay? And, and gold as well that was presented to Jesus as was prophesied there in Isaiah chapter 16. But I want you to notice in verse 11, it said, And when they were come into the house, when they were come into the house, now that should immediately tell you that this did not take place at the birth of Christ, okay? Because if you remember the story, keep your finger there, turn to Luke chapter 2. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Verse 7, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. So it's a manger. That's basically a feeding, um, what do they call it? Feeding trough uh, for animals. Okay. Why did they put him there? Why did they put him there? Um, in, in the manger? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay. There was no room for them. So they ended up having to go somewhere where there were animals, I suppose. And lay this baby in a manger. But notice there in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came, they're now in a house. They have a place to rest their heads. 
They have you know, a roof over their heads and they don't need to necessarily put a baby in a manger anymore. Okay? So some time has taken place after this. Okay? It's no longer a babe, but a young child. And uh, look at verse number 12. Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. Verse number 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So the wise men have departed another way, and God warned them, don't go back to Herod. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Okay, so God warns Joseph, right, the man of the house. Hey, look, you need to get out of here. Go to Egypt, because this evil King Herod will seek to kill Jesus Christ. And I love how Joseph responds in verse 14. Remember, Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. Right? He's the stepfather of Jesus. He married Mary. But what I love about him is that he's a great man of faith. He's obedient to, to the Lord. In verse 14, it says, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. All right? So we see when he hears from God, Joseph acts. Okay? He's obedient. He's obedient to the Lord God. And number two, you know, he's a great man. He's a great father. He's a great husband. He seeks to protect his family. Okay, knowing that there's, a, there's, there's going to be evil, knowing that people are seeking to destroy them, he seeks to protect his family. Okay, so we see some great attributes of a godly man, faithful, obedient, and protective of his family. Verse number fifteen. <laughs> Verse number fifteen. And was there in Egypt, that is, until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt have I called my son. So this is another prophecy in the Old Testament that was spoken of Jesus Christ, that he would have to come out of Egypt, that God the Father would call out his son out of Egypt. Now this is a really interesting uh, uh, passage to turn to. Um, if you can turn to Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Hosea chapter 11, because we're going to see uh, an example of another double fulfillment, okay? Some prophecies, some rites of the scriptures have a double fulfillment, something that took place at that point in time, but also reflected was something that will take place later in the future, okay? Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, look at this, when Israel was a child... Then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So that's the reference we read in Matthew chapter 2. And then verse 2, um, it says, As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. So notice that here in, in Hosea, Hosea 11 verse 1, it's talking, the context, the direct context here, is of the nation of Israel. That God saw uh, the nation of Israel as a child, which obviously in the, in the book of Exodus, you know, left Egypt. All right? They left Egypt with Moses. But unfortunately, as you guys know the story, you know, many of them turned to false gods. You know how they built that golden uh, calf and they worshipped that golden calf? I mean, that's just the beginning of the problems. We know through their history, they would turn and worship false gods and burn incense to them. And that's what God is saying here in verse number 2. That even though he called them, they sacrificed the false gods, the Balaam, and burned incense to graven images. And they had statues and images that they would worship. Okay? So I just want to show you this quite an interesting thing in Hosea. What is being referenced in Matthew chapter 2 is about Israel, in verse number 1, okay, the nation of Israel. But the, the greater fulfillment, okay, the purpose of that verse, was to teach us about Jesus Christ. That he too would go into Egypt and come out of Egypt. Okay? That's just an amazing thing, because if you were just reading Hosea, you would have no idea that that was about Jesus. Okay? And, uh, and you know, <clears throat> when you're really familiar with the New Testament, and you're really familiar with the story of redemption, salvation, you know, when you go back to the Old Testament, you're going to see all these amazing things that just seem to parallel Jesus Christ. And uh, this is the way it is. You know, the, the Bible is a supernatural, amazing book. You go back and you'll just notice all these things about Jesus. All right? Anyway, back to Matthew chapter 2. Back to Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, verse 16. <clears throat> then Herod, 
when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So notice that in the, the second part of verse 16, it says that he uh, slew all the children right, from two years old and under. So all the children in Bethlehem and in the surrounding areas, if you're two years old or under, you were put to death, you were killed uh, by the armies of Herod. All right? Now this is why many people, and myself included, believe that when the wise men came to see Jesus, that the, the, uh, Jesus may have been about two years old at this stage. He may have already been about two years old. Because notice that it says, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So he, he was able to work out, well, they first saw that, 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 that star about two years ago, and so I'm going to kill all the children that are two years old and under, and that should take care of the king of the Jews. That should wipe him out, okay? Not knowing, obviously, that they had escaped into Egypt. So a very wicked act, very wicked act by this man. Verse number 17. Verse number 17. I mean, just think about it. If you're a mother and your two-year-old baby is taken and, and killed, you know, it's just a sad thing. Look at this in verse 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, or that's Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation, and weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. So because they are not is because they're, they're not alive. They've been, they've been killed. It's interesting that you mentioned Rachel here. Um, if you guys know the significance of Rachel, I think it's just symbolic of... Um, uh, what, what was the man's name that married Rachel? The two, the two sisters. What was it? was um, Jacob. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, they became Israel. Jacob married the two, you know, Leah and Rachel. And if you remember the story of Rachel, she was really sad because Leah was having all the children. And she, she didn't have any children herself. And it, it brought her great depression, great sorrow. And I think that's why, just symbolically, they use the name of Rachel here. is because it's kind of like Rachel where she was barren. But these women, in, in the same way now, have they lost their children. You know, it's even worse, I guess. They've lost their children. But again, notice in verse 17, this was a prophecy okay, of Jeremiah. So keep your finger there. Turn to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. Because if we just read this in Matthew, it's a really sad story. All right, we, we end with these babies being killed, these mothers weeping in sorrow. But if we go to Jeremiah, it actually brings great hope to this story. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter uh, 31, verse 15. I'll just read it now. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. It says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children. Because they were not. Okay? So let's keep reading. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. So the Lord says, look, you've lost your children, but you need to stop weeping now. There's, there's comfort. I'm bringing you comfort. You know, uh, it says, for thy work shall be rewarded. The work of you bearing children and having these children, it's going to be rewarded, says the Lord. Okay? Verse 17. Uh, sorry, at the end of verse 16, it says, And they shall come again from the land of the enemy. So God says, they're coming back. Don't worry about it. They're coming back. Verse 17. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. Okay? These children that these ladies lost at this point in time, you know, God reminds them. And, you know, I believe, and I hope you do as well, the Bible's quite clear about this, is that little children that die... They go to heaven. Okay, every aborted baby, every miscarriage, you know, if you lose children at a young age, they're saved. Okay, they're saved. They, they go into heaven. And of course, how do we understand this? Well, we know at the resurrection that the dead in Christ shall rise once again, the resurrected bodies. And as we go into the millennial kingdom, guess what? Guess what we're going to see? We're going to see these little children again. These little children that King Herod wiped out. They're going to be brought back into that land, and he's just telling the mothers, don't worry, they're coming back. They're going to be back, and they're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ forever and ever. So, you know, that, that's what's beautiful about going back to the Old Testament. You see these little nuggets. We see how God comforts these women with this, the writings in the Old Testament. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. 
But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and they came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Achilles did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. So let me explain a couple of things here, just for your Bible knowledge. Okay? So we see Herod, now he has died. Okay? Now, the history books generally call this Herod, Herod the Great. Okay? Herod the Great. And we know that he dies here. But if you guys remember, what was the name of the, the man that uh, beheaded John the Baptist? That was Herod as well. Okay, and that was Herod as well. But it's another Herod. And, and usually, uh, I think in the Bible, it calls him Herod the Tetrarch. I think, I think that's a label they, they give him. But we see in this verse here, in, in verse number, what we just read there, in verse number 22. But when he had heard that Achilles did reign in Judea in the room of his father, Herod. So we see Achilles is the son of Herod. Okay? And he rules um, in the place of Herod. Um, but what's interesting about this, and you know, the fact that secular history lines up with what the Bible says, is that Herod had three sons. Okay? Um, Achilles, which what we just saw there. Then Philip was another one, and his other son was Herod, the other Herod, the one that uh, beheaded John the Baptist. Okay? And if you remember, the reason why John the Baptist preaches, and we're going to cover this, I think it's chapter 14, I think, in this book. Uh, um, uh, when when Her um, John the Baptist preached against Herod, it's because he took his brother Philip's wife and married her. Okay? So we see that Herod the Great had three sons. Um, Achilles, Herod, and Philip. And even though the Bible doesn't really spell this out for us, say he had three sons, and the, but secular history basically confirms that this kingdom was then, uh, you know, the, the, the three sons would take different portions of this kingdom and, and rule there. And we just see how consistent the Bible is and how lined up it is uh, with secular history. Anyway, that was just for, in for information. Go to verse 23, Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. It says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that he might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Okay? He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, here's another interesting thing. Notice in verse 23, it says, Which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. But did you know that's not anywhere else in the scriptures? That's not found anywhere in the Old Testament. A lot of people have tried to find verses and be like, well, this might be the verse that it's referring to. But it, honestly, it's not there. If you try to find this passage, it's not there. So is, do we have a contradiction in the Bible? Is there an error? What do you reckon? No, of course, there wouldn't be a contradiction in the Bible, would there? And I think, I think the key thing here is when you look at verse number 23, it says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. Okay, which was spoken by the prophets. It's not saying here that it was written by the prophets, was it? Okay. Now, some of the things that the prophets spoke were written, of course. Okay, they spoke, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and the things were written. But other times they spoke, it was never, it's not written. In fact, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find many prophets and they're named or sometimes not named and they, not, they don't have any writings to the name. Okay, it wasn't canonized in Scripture by God. But we can see immediately, look, it's not, you know, a contradiction, it's not an error, it's just us. You know, I love how God's very uh, specific. You know, it was spoken by the prophet. Oh, okay, spoken. I guess this time it wasn't written. It's not something that we can refer <laughs> back to it. Uh, but yeah, there's no contradiction there in the Bible. But I just wanted to, why was he called a Nazarene? Okay, now, oh man, so many Christians mess this up, all right? So it's not that hard. Why was he called, I'll let anyone, anyone that knows the answer, they're in verse 23. If the answer's in verse 23. Why was he called a Nazarene? Very easy. It's not, not a trick question. Anyone wants to answer that one? I'll let you guys try. Yeah, because yeah, he grew up in Nazareth, okay? <laughs> he grew up in Nazareth, and that's why he's called a Nazarene. Now, a lot of people, a lot of painters that want to depict Jesus Christ, how do they draw him? With long hair, right? With long hair. And um, the reason a lot of them do this is because they read this and think he's a Nazarite. Okay, a Nazarite. Now, if you guys know what a Nazarite is, it's not about where they grew up or where they're from. A Nazarite would make a vow to God like Samson. You know, you read about Samson, the judge Samson. He was a, a Nazarite. 
he made a, 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 there was a, a, an, an oath that he would make to God. And part of that requirement is that he would uh, let his hair grow. That he would not have his razor, um, you know, uh, cut his hair. You know, and that, that, you know the story, how he lost his power when, when I think he told Delilah about um, his power and how he you know, was in the long hair and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there was other requirements that he was not to eat um, or, or drink, eat of grapes and, and other things. I, I don't remember what they all are right now. Uh, but that was a special vow that was made by Nazarite, okay? But Jesus was not a Nazarite, and a lot of people get this confused. They think, well, he must have had long hair, like John the Baptist, and like uh, Samson, and that's how they depict him. So, you know, as we go through these chapter by chapter, I hope to not just give you, you know, just, just explain some of these verses, but also show you where people really mess up the scriptures. And, um, you know, it, it's really important for us to understand, uh, you know, the story of, 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 of his birth, the story of his crucifixion, the stories that we see in the Bible. Because, you know, Hollywood, movies and, and television cartoons, they've got a lot of nice stories, a lot of good stuff from the Bible. And, you know, you might be comfortable in saying, hey, I'm going to let the kids watch this. And I'm not necessarily against that, but you need to be aware that a lot of these stories are messed up. A lot of these stories aren't telling the truth. And when your kids open up their Bibles and start reading, it's like, that doesn't line up with what I remember. That doesn't line up with what I saw. And so I think it's important as we go through chapter by chapter that we, we do cover the misconceptions that we see in Scripture as well. All right? So one last thing that I want to talk about, I pretty much covered that chapter there. I hope that was interesting for you. But one last thing I want to cover, just as we're, we're approaching Christmas, a lot of people ask me this question, a lot of people struggle with this. You know, should Christians celebrate Christmas? Should Christians celebrate Christmas? Now, take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 24. John chapter 4, verse 24. Should Christians celebrate Christmas? John chapter 4, verse 24. Look at this. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in <laughs> truth. Hey, if you want your worship to be counted, all right, there's a lot of empty and vain worship today. There's a lot of churches, there's a lot of false religions that believe they're worshipping God, they believe they're singing His praises, but they're not doing that, okay? Because they're not worshipping Him in spirit and in truth, okay? Now, what does it mean to worship Him in spirit? Obviously, it's someone that has the Holy Spirit, someone that's been born of the Holy Ghost, someone that has that new man, okay? That new man is perfect before God, it has the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The only people that can truly worship God are those that are in the spirit, Okay? Those that are saved, those that are born again. Okay? But also, we need to worship Him in truth. Okay? Worship Him in truth. And there's one big lie of Christmas. And by the way, I'm not against Christmas. If you want to celebrate Christmas, go for it. Even I celebrated it. But one big lie uh, that a lot of kids here is not that Santa Claus is bringing them presents. I mean, that's one big lie. So that definitely is one of them. But one that's quite similar, that has a similar effect. You know when, when kids are being taught about Santa Claus and then they hear the truth? I mean, you know how parents are kind of like, oh, don't talk about it, don't mention it, because they, they still don't know, they think it's true. They think Santa Claus is bringing them gifts. When kids find out that Santa Claus is not real, they're devastated, okay? Maybe they're devastated because they had all this love for Santa Claus to begin with, but they're also devastated. Uh, I've seen, many people have told me this, I, I didn't grow up believing in Santa Claus, but they're saying that the parents lied to them. Like, Why did they lie to me? Why did they just tell me it came from them? You know, what a silly thing to be lying about, right? But one thing that Christian parents sometimes do with their children is they tell their children that Jesus was born on December the 25th. Okay, December 25th. Now, I don't have time to go through all of this today, all right? But it's very, very unlikely, okay? I'm not saying that it's totally out of the realm of possibility, but it's very, very unlikely that Jesus was born on December the 25th, okay? So please be mindful. If we want to worship God in spirit and in truth, then we do that. You know, uh, no problem. Let's let's celebrate his birth on December the 25th. But just be mindful of your children to explain to them that probably not likely, probably not even the right season that he was born. Okay, but it, it's not so much about the day; it's about the celebration. You know, we're celebrating the birth of Christ, and there's really nothing wrong with that in of itself. Okay, to to take a time to worship him, to celebrate his birth, that he came into the world, and that ultimately that he would be that sacrifice that we know about the free gift of God. Hey, that's a great thing to celebrate, you know? And if you want to do that on December the 25th, go for it, all right? If you want to do it on December the 26th, go for it. If you want to do it on February the 10th, 
go for it, right? But just be mindful, look, when we worship God, we need to make sure we do it in spirit and in truth. And this is why I wanted to cover just a little bit about the wise men, because a lot of people think the wise men were there at the birth of Christ. Okay, but that's not the truth. Okay, that's not, not the truth. So, yeah, please be aware of that. Now, turn to Psalm 118. Turn to Psalm 118, please. Because then the question is, well, then you've got the other, you've got the other extreme. The other extreme is like, you know, it, it's sinful. It's wicked to celebrate Christmas. It's wicked to come on December the 25th and have anything to do with Christmas. Because a lot of people recognize that a lot of the Christmas traditions have pagan roots. Okay, there's a lot of pagan roots to Christmas traditions. And I'm not going to go through all that. If you guys are interested, you can look it up yourself. All right? There are some pagan roots, you know, such as people that worship uh, the sun on December 25th. Okay, the actual, the actual sun itself. And be like, well, you know, if we worship Christ's birth on December 25th, you know, we're participating in the sin. We're participating in pagan worship, they say. Okay? But look, is there, is there anything sinful about a day? Is there anything sinful about December the 25th? Is there... What day do people do Halloween? Is there October something? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Is, is there anything sinful about that day in of itself? Of course not. It's not. Look, 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 at, look at this in Psalm 118, verse 24. Psalm 118, verse 24. It says, This is the day... Which day? Doesn't matter. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, every day is a day that the Lord hath made. And what's the requirement? That we rejoice and be glad that God has given us another day. All right? So please don't be the Baptist Grinch that tries to steal Christmas from everybody else. You go, man, it's, it's, I can't believe you're, you're celebrating Christmas. Don't you know it's a wicked, pagan holiday? Hey, look, it's a day that God has made. And I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to, you know, Halloween, whatever day was Halloween, I remember just driving. We'll go to church. We'll go to church service. We're seeing all these kids. You know, these, these girls dressed like whores and, and these, you know, little kids dressed up like devils. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I'm really sad about that. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. I'm going to worship Him and praise Him. I'm going to rejoice because this is the day that God has made. You think there's something sinful with me going to church and, and rejoicing and celebrating on that day of Halloween? Of course not. Okay, the day belongs to the Lord. Just because certain people, you know, do wicked things on those days does not mean that it's wicked in of itself for us to celebrate the Lord. Okay? There's nothing sinful with celebrating the birth of Christ. Okay? There's nothing sinful about getting your friends and your family together and enjoying a nice meal. There's nothing sinful about giving presents. All right? I mean, the, the Father gives us, you know, um, what's it say? Every good gift comes from the, from the Father above. You know? And we know that Jesus Christ is our free gift. We know that He's our gift for salvation as well, don't we? There's nothing wrong with giving gifts. And is there anything wrong with celebrating Christ's birth, giving gifts, and eating together with people on December the 25th, which is a day that the Lord has made, and He commands us to rejoice and be glad in it? Of course not. Of course not, okay? And uh, so please, you know, all I'm saying is, it's your call. You know, how you want to celebrate a Christmas, that's up to each family. I don't have a set rule. You know, this Christmas day, December 25th, we're driving back to Queensland. And I guess we'll sing some carols in the van or something. I mean, that's how we, we celebrate Christmas. You know, it doesn't, I, I'm, not, I'm not that bothered about it. I, I, I don't take too much interest in it. But at the same time, you know, it's a great time because a lot of people have time off work to get together and celebrate. Nothing better than to celebrate Jesus Christ. I think it's a wonderful thing. Okay? So I hope that answers any questions about should we celebrate Christmas. Because, you know, there are, there are two extremes. There's the extreme where you're celebrating Christ but you're not living in truth. Then that worship won't be received by the Lord. But then you've got the other extreme. It's like, oh, it's all pagan. You can't do anything. You know, and you're doing that. It's all sinful. No, that's not. That's a total other extreme as well. Okay. So I'm all for it as long as we're worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. All right. Let's pray.